<clears throat> All right, welcome everyone to the forgotten season, fall gardening at home and school. Um, we are uh, Seed St. Louis. I am Dean Gunderson, Director of Education, and I'm here with Abby Schumacher. I'm a school educator, so I work with our um, with our school program, teachers and students. So we'll be covering, um, yeah, fall gardening, um, and I'm I'm excited. This is the first time we've we've co-taught, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, so also let us know <laughs> <laughs> what you thought if you like if you like it. So first, um, just kind of some general kind of definitions and ideas, what we will be talking about, what we won't be talking about. So fall gardening is basically consisting of the cool season crops that you harvest in fall and early winter. So you are gardening in the fall. There are still like warm season crops growing in the fall, but that's not what we're going to be talking about planting. We're going to be talking about those cool season crops that you plant for the harvest um, later in the year. There are also crops that you can plant in late summer to harvest in winter, or even that you would harvest next spring. We are not gonna be talking about those specifically. Um, we will be talking about those in our next class, which is winter gardening and overwintering crops, um, which is next month. Um, but much of the information for those winter and overwintering crops is very similar to this. And so a lot of this base information is translatable just some of the dates shift. So what we're going to go over today is we're going to kind of talk about wrapping up summer. So kind of some some um, some tips on the uh, end of your warm season crops. We're going to talk about some fall crop biology just to kind of lay the groundwork so that we understand when we're planting and why, um, what to plant for a fall harvest, protection from heat, which is important to get your um, fall stuff established protection from frost, which can be helpful at the end of the season if you have things that aren't quite ready yet. And then we're gonna finish it off with uh, the outdoor classroom in fall. So for the most part, fall gardening is a mirror of spring gardening. So a lot of the stuff that you did in the spring, you're just doing again, but just in reverse. So instead of planting kind of when there's still frost and then going until it's hot, you're planting when it's hot and you're harvesting when the frosts are happening. And almost everything that you grew in the spring, you can grow again, but fall gardening starts in the summer. Um, if you wait until fall, it is too late. And this is probably the biggest mistake that we see with people that are wanting to do fall gardening. They think of fall gardening in September, whenever it starts getting nice outside. Um, and at that point, it is too, it's, it's too late. There's not enough time for those <clears throat> plants to grow. Um, before it gets too cold and too dark, which we'll talk about, for them to actually reach a harvestable size. So this is kind of where I wanted to jump in because I think the number one question that we get about school gardens is basically how does that work? Because kids aren't around in the summer, teachers are off in the summer for the most part, at least for like a solid month. Um, so people are often wondering like, how do you how do you make this happen? Um, so I'm going to give you a few tips about making your job easier because you essentially have two options with a school garden. You can let your garden grow throughout the summer, or you can kind of put it to sleep. But either way, if you want to utilize your school garden in the fall, you're going to have something to do over the summer. So if you're letting your garden grow, then you're going to have like crop maintenance, weeding, watering, harvesting, all of those things throughout the summer. And there's a lot of summer stuff that actually like you're harvesting in the fall when kids are back to school. So this is actually, if you can make it happen, I think it's definitely worth your while to keep the garden active throughout the summer. Your other option is kind of closing it up at the end of the school year and putting it to sleep. But if you do that, you still have summer work right now in terms of like prepping and planning and planting for the fall. So either way, you're gonna have to make something happen in the summer. Um, so a couple of tips for that. If you're letting your garden grow, mulch is really effective for, keep, for weed suppression and also temperature regulation. So I would very much suggest mulching certain spots in your garden to keep the weeds down. 
irrigation systems are also really crucial because like watering with our heat like today is sort of the number one challenge for schools when people aren't around. So getting on some type of schedule is really good for that. And if you can put in an ir irrigation system, that's even better. And I'll say a few more words about like building capacity for doing these things throughout the summer. Um, the other option is to close up your bed. So you'll see a picture here of some beds that have been closed up for summer. You basically just lay like weed fabric or cardboard down take the plants out, you know, you don't have to like till so much, but just like take everything out, cover it up, put some rocks or bricks or whatever on top of it. So it doesn't blow away. Um, and that's how you leave it until you're ready to plant again. So pretty simple, but you will have to be waking it up now if you want to do fall gardening. Okay. <clears throat> nope. Thank you. Okay, so just a few words then about like how how do you build capacity throughout the summer when people are away? When we initially take schools through our process, um, oops, it's like lots of typos there, but <laughs> I think it makes sense. Yeah. Um, so initially, when you go through our process, whether you're a school or a community garden, we work on something called asset-based community development, and that basically just means that you're identifying people, gifts, skills, resources, assets in your community that you can then rely on for various support, various kinds of support for your garden. Um, so we're not just talking about like teachers <laughs> for school gardens. Um, not all of that pressure and responsibility should be on teachers, right? So engage students, engage parents, engage neighbors, community members, other organizations, um, really doing that outreach work ahead of time. Winter is a great time to do that so that you can be prepared for spring and have a plan for summer. So making sure that you're doing some outreach to get um, a good, good community of people um, to help support the garden. Weekly signups are a great way to go about this. So basically that's just like sending out this signup sheet where a family or a neighbor or a staff person volunteers for one week to take care of the garden. They get to harvest whatever is available and do with it as they like. Um, and in return, they're, they're watering and weeding a little bit. Um, and usually that's a reasonable commitment for people throughout the summer. Some schools decide to do like an adopt-a-bed situation um, where your garden basically becomes a community garden throughout the summer. So not necessarily members of your immediate school community, but you can, anybody that's interested in like having a plot that like lives in the neighborhood um, can sort of adopt your garden bed for the summer and take care of it and then return it to you in the fall. Summer is a great time to host work days or harvest parties to share food, process food together, whether that's like pickling, drying, freezing things that students can then see in the fall when they return. Um, or just sort of having gatherings and welcoming people into the space. Um, you could also do farm stands or make sure you're donating regularly to a local food pantry. So lots of different ways to keep your garden active in the summer. Um, and I think the most important thing is just, just that it's not falling to like one or two people to take care of, but really kind of doing that work ahead of time to, to have some support throughout the summer. And a lot of that too is also helpful, you know, for the community gardens out there that struggle as well, like people going on vacation or stuff. I mean, a lot of those same ideas um, can translate. And I've seen a lot of those done at um, community gardens as well. Mm -hmm. So this is just an example of a summer maintenance plan. You can design things however you want. Some people get more specific with um, particular garden tasks at, at different times of the summer. Um, but you can also just do like name, phone number, what week you have, send that out online and get people signed up before summer begins. Okay, so transitioning to fall. If you have let your garden grow, um, you can also let it go a little bit if you want to use the garden as an outdoor classroom in the fall. So 
With your summer crops, um, one thing that you can do is seed saving, which in and of itself is a really great science and life cycle and biology lesson. Really easy things to save seed from if you've never done it before are things like beans. Um, those basically just dry on the vine and you save save the pods and shell them and then you have dry bean seeds. Um, tomatoes are a really easy like fermentation process if you want to save seeds from tomatoes. Lettuce, letting lettuce go to seed um, or many other types of greens and saving those seeds. Those are all really easy. Flower seeds are really easy. Um, they do have to be open pollinated seeds rather than hybrid seeds if you want to reliably get the same type of plant in your garden. So seed saving is really fun and you can like let your crops kind of keep going to save some seeds. Hi. Um, you can also work on saving materials for indoor use and study. So what I mean by that is like collecting soil sam samples while you can still dig in the ground, you know, before it gets too cold in the fall or in the winter. Um, and using that for various types of soils, soil science lessons, um, saving interesting seed heads or seed pods. Those things are really good for studying adaptations, right? Like how things survive and grow. Um, and not this, not just science too, you know, you can like press leaves and flowers and do various sorts of art projects. You can like build, save gourds and make birdhouses out of them. Um, lots you can save from the garden, bring inside for the colder weather um, and use for whatever you're doing with your curriculum. And also I think this applies to like summer, fall and winter really. Like sometimes I think that cleanup of a garden space is a little overrated. It's okay to leave some wild spaces, some overturned pots, some leaves, some brush piles, um, seed seed pods, seed heads, all of these things are really good for studying birds and bugs and decomposition um, throughout the throughout the fall and even into the winter. So yeah, kind of letting it letting it grow and then letting it go a little bit and you'll have sort of more options out outside for learning in a variety of of ways um, yeah and the um and just to go with that too like like you're saying in terms of even like studying insects and birds we do also have a class that we did with a researcher earlier this year that's up on our youtube that goes into more detail about how those um leaving those things in the garden in um in certain ways can be really effective at promoting um, native bees specifically but a lot of that ca um carries over to native insects and birds mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah, that the the cleaning up is overrated. <laughs> yeah, um, and I would also say sometimes that's one of the main challenges for schools is they'll get complaints about, oh, it looks, looks so messy, like nobody's taking care of that. And I would just say like, if this is your plan, just put up some signs. Students can make them. They can like put signs around the garden just to show the community and other people at the school, like this is what we're studying. This is why it looks like this. This is why we left this here. Um, and then they'll see that it's a learning space. Um, one more thought about summer transitioning to fall is there's a few crops, which Dean's gonna talk next about like what crops specifically do well in the fall and when you should plant them and all of that. Um, for schools, there's a lot that you can like, a lot of low maintenance stuff that can be growing over the summer that you'll be harvesting in the fall. Um, things like sweet potatoes, which don't require a lot of maintenance. Um, and we actually have a sweet potato contest for schools that you can register for. Um, winter squash is a really good Kind of low maintenance thing you'll be harvesting in the fall um, stores both of those things store really well um, again beans not only for for seed saving but to just eat for dry bean harvests that's something that grows in the summer and you can harvest in the fall um, all kinds of grains that are fun for making cultural connections with students things like amaranth and sorghum popcorn is really fun for kids um, 
so yeah, so those are those are all things that you can like easily grow over the summer that you'll be harvesting and using in the fall, um, both, you know, just to to harvest and eat and also for various curriculum connections. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, so just some basic kind of um, biology here for as we move into the fall seasons. Um, like we mentioned a little bit, uh, cool season vegetables are those that grow in spring and fall and increasingly into our winter as our winters are kind of generally mild except for one big cold spell. Um, so basically they will grow until we get that big cold spell uh, a lot of winters now. Uh, a few cool season crops will grow over the summer, mostly um, kale, collards, and chard, but most will become bitter or have dramatically slower growth in the summer, even if they do survive the summer. Um, so if you have ones that are surviving the summer, they will start to grow better as we move into fall. So your chard, your kale, your collards, they will continue, they will they will survive the summer, but they're really going to thrive in that cool weather, which is why we call them cool season vegetables. Um, so cool season crops, what makes them uh, unique against warm season crops is that they can tolerate uh, frost. Um, they can survive temperatures below 32 degrees, which warm season crops cannot do. And that's, that's actually the main distinction there. However, frost is not as cut and dry, as it would seem, uh, when it comes to plants, uh, and particularly when people talk about a first frost date. Um, so that date is really important to know so that you can schedule when you're going to, when you're going to do things. A lot of times when you see a seed packet or you see just like um, uh, rules or explanations of when to plant things, they're using that frost date as the indicator. They'll say, you know, 10 weeks, before the last or before the first frost or, you know, two weeks before the first frost or the last frost or, you know, like, like, you know, that's kind of the date that is used. But that frost date is not a cut and dry thing. Our weather is not that predictable. Um, it's a statistical average of past weather. So in the fall, what we are talking about with frost is again, a, a chance. So um, October 10th, at that point, statistically, there's a 10% chance that there will be a frost by that date. The first frost date is the is the 50-50 date a lot of times. So that is October 27th. But that means by October 27th, in half of our years, there's already been a frost. And then by November 11th, there 90% of the years, you know, nine years out of 10, there will have been a frost by November 11th. So, you know, again, it's all it's all a range. You know, that's a full month difference between a 10% and a 90% chance. Um, so that's important to know because that's because that frost is when your warm season crops are going to die. And uh, it's important to know as well because it depends on how cold a frost you get, depends on what um, is going to happen. So there's a light frost. So a light frost is usually what we get for the first couple freezes that we get, which is if the temperature gets between 28 and 32 degrees. So that's what we call a light frost. There's also a hard frost, which is anything below 28 degrees, and anything below 10 degrees is what's called a killing frost. There's really not any vegetables that we grow that will survive a killing frost, which is why it's called that. And the vegetables that we do grow that are cool season, so remember now warm season crops will not survive any freeze at all, uh, but there are some like beets, carrots, chard, and lettuce that will really only tolerate a light frost. Um, so those, if we get below 28 degrees, those are also going to die. But things like on this list on the right, uh, your brassicas, your mustards, your onion, parsley, peas, um, you know, spinach, uh, arugula should be on here. I don't think it is, but arugula should be on there. Um, so those will all handle a hard frost. Um, so below 28 degrees, but somewhere between 10 and 28 degrees, each of these will also die. Um, so that just gives you kind of your, your range of temperatures because eventually we do get below 28 degrees. So again, there is kind of that, that limit to where they will survive. Um, one thing looking at this list, particularly for younger kids, does not look appealing, right? 
cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, call it like not necessarily things that you would, you would think of planting um, in a school garden for children, like maybe not super appealing, but um, just a couple of tips here. I think anything that can be like pureed or made into pesto is, is great for kids and they will eat it. I've made pestos with carrot tops, with chard, with broccoli, with spinach, um, basically with parsley, like basically any type of green, um, you can make some kind of pesto or dip or like pasta sauce with. And we all know children love pasta. So it's like, they're actually like really great crops to integrate vegetables in unique ways to sort of like sneak them in for kids. Um, I would also say anything like sensory um, that has a really strong taste is fun for, for schools, even if you're not using a lot of it. Um, mustard, parsley, radish, onion, um, even turnip, like sometimes kids, if they're out in the garden, they will just want to taste things and they might not have the best reaction to it, but they do become like more adventurous eaters when exposed, when they're exposed to things growing. Um, other things that are really fun for schools. Um, I think color is also just really fun. Mm -hmm. And many of these things come in like rainbow color, right? Radishes, carrots, beets, chard. You can have like a whole rainbow garden um with fall stuff which purple is purple brassicas yes which is yeah. really fun as well um in terms of garden-based learning with these types of crops right roots and shoots you can study lots of roots and leaves um how they function um, and how they adapt to their environments um these are also foods that we use locally for our harvest celebrations you know not necessarily just um Thanksgiving, but it's really a good time to do some like historical and cultural connections with foods and the types of things that sort of grow year round and, and the dishes that we make out of food when the, when the weather starts to turn. So another thing that a lot of people don't think about, but is really critical when we're talking about fall and in our next class, winter gardening is um, a lot of times people are just thinking about the cold. They're thinking that that is the limiting factor. That's what is stopping the growth. And as we talked about, the cold is significant because there is a temperature at which these plants will die. But you know, you could put these plants in a heated, you know, little home and like run furnaces to keep them warm. But eventually, they will stop growing as we go into the fall because the days get shorter. And when the day gets short enough, there is not enough light coming in for the plant to get enough energy to maintain itself and to grow. Basically the light level drops or the, the light intensity and the, and the length of day drops to a point at which the plant is only able to maintain its current state, even if it's warm enough to stay alive. And this is why it's really important to make sure you get your crops in early enough and not wait until the fall because the sun truly is the limiting factor. And if there isn't enough light, heat doesn't matter. Um, and the shorter the days, the slower the plant growth. So another thing that you will notice with fall gardening, which is again, kind of the, the reverse of spring gardening, is that your plants are gonna be growing the fastest in the early part of the season. And they're gonna, the growth is gonna be slowing as you move later and later into the season. So some people call this phenomena, um, where where you get these days that are too short for growth, the Persephone days. Um, so these are days with less than ten hours of sunlight, because that seems to be the cutoff. Is when the temp was is when the daylight hits uh, ten hours. Is when your plants, for the most part, are not going to grow anymore in terms of leafy material. The one kind of strange exception to this that um, that I have noticed is that broccoli. If if you get to the main head before this point and you cut it, they will tend to continue to produce side shoots in this period. Um, they will produce them very slowly, but they will kind of produce them, mostly because the plant is kind of cannibalizing itself. Like it's kind of like reusing it, like eating up its own resources to continue to try and flower. Um, so broccoli is kind of this one weird exception. And in St. Louis, um, at our latitude, those Persephone days last from November 18th 
through January 23rd. So those are the days at which even if you if you keep plants warm enough, there's not going to be any growth. But if you think about it, if 10 hours is the cutoff, you know, the several weeks before November 18th, when the days are only like 10 minutes longer, you're you're still going to be seeing very, very slow growth, which is why it is important to start things early. Um, and so when you grow crops in the fall, the general rule of thumb is to add 14 days to the days to maturity. So if you have a seed packet, you know, like this one here for cabbage, Copenhagen market, it says 65 to 75 days, um, cool season. But all seed packets, when they have these days, those days to maturity are for a spring planting where you're planting and then the growth is accelerating as they're moving into more and more sunlight. In the fall, because it's the reverse, you really need to start them about 14 days earlier. So although cabbage takes you know 65 to 75 days in spring, it could take you know up to six, up to 90 days in the fall. So you just want to you know look at that, understand what your seed packet is saying, and make sure you have enough time. All of this is also really good um, for garden-based learning, um, like math math skills. Um, kids can be you know doing like weather-based observations and experiments tracking growth, doing a lot of measuring, um, data collection, um, calculating when things need to be planted, um, all of all of those sorts of connections um, with, with math and science and growing um, fall is a really great time for that. Mm -hmm. And then this is just the calendar. We talk about it in all of our classes because it's a, it's a nifty little tool that we have that is free for anyone to use um, that can be helpful for the fall as well as the other seasons where you can see when we are generally recommending that you would be planting these things. And as you can see for the fall, a lot of it is the second half of July and the beginning of August, which again is much earlier than most people would anticipate anticipate planting fall things. Um, but you can see here pretty much straight down the line, it's this first half of August is really critical for getting things in the ground if you're wanting to get a harvest before this frost date or um, in that period. And it's again, not as much the cold, but that by the time you get to late October, you're less than a month away from that, that critical 10 hour mark where stuff is just going to be growing very, very slowly. So most of this growth really needs to happen in August and September when the days are still long. Uh, another thing that I like to put in here, just so that people aren't <laughs> wasting their money, um, is what we recommend as the best way to plant things in terms of what we have found is like horticulturally the most beneficial. Um, I do want to clarify here that if you like seedlings, if seedlings are helpful for you um, because they're you know more fun for your kids to plant or it's easier for you to um, to recognize the plant or something like that, I am not in any way saying that you cannot do seedlings of these things over here that I have seeds for, but I'm saying that there isn't a horticultural benefit. And because seedlings are more expensive, you don't necessarily need to spend that money unless you want to. But for seedlings, the ones that are really, the plants that are really beneficial to grow as seedlings, because you're just much more likely to get a good harvest are these brassicas. It's your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts, your cabbage, collard, kale, kohlrabi, cauliflower. These are plants that grow very slowly when they're young. And so it's helpful to get seedlings where you know some of that slow young growth has already happened. And then for, for seeds, the things that grow better from seed are um, the things like your, your root crops, your beets, your carrot, your chard, um, turnips, radishes, um, leafy greens like spinach, you know, parsley, mustard, lettuce, um, all of those things do um, just as well or better from seeds than seedlings. And then there are a couple exceptions um, in terms of there are some things that do well in spring that are cool season crops that do well in spring, but don't do real well in fall that generally we don't recommend. Um, some people have luck with them, but for the most part, they don't work well in St. Louis. Those would be onions, specifically bulbing onions. If you're wanting like a big bulb onion to cut, it doesn't really work in fall because of what triggers that bulbing in the plant is a day length change and the day length is moving in the wrong direction. So bulbing onions don't work in the fall, but green onions are a phenomenal fall crop. If you like scallions or green onions, definitely plant those in the fall. Peas are another ones that are hard to grow 
for to get pods because generally by the time they're flowering and trying to produce those pods, which is pretty energy intensive, I mean, that's a baby basically, they're doing the energy to produce their seed uh, that takes a lot of energy. And again, we're moving in kind of the, the opposite direction. So by the time that they're trying to do that is when they're getting the least amount of energy. So I have seen people grow pea pods in the fall, but it's, it's generally not real successful. And then potatoes. The main reason that potatoes don't work is that it's really hard to find potatoes in the fall that are like ready to sprout. Um, but you can do potatoes in the fall, particularly new potatoes are doable, but getting a like full potato crop in the fall is a little tricky. And then there are some things that you can do in the spring, but are easier to do in the fall. So this is primarily the heading brassicas, especially broccoli and cauliflower are easier to do in the fall because when they're forming that head is when it's relatively cool as opposed to in the spring, they're trying to form that head when it's hot. Um, and so since they're forming it when it's cool, it's le they're less likely to bolt, it's less likely to get bitter or hot or spicy. And so broccoli and cauliflower tend to do better in the fall. And then the really heat sensitive greens that like to bolt really quickly um, do better in the fall. So that would be things like arugula, spinach, and cilantro do well in the fall here. And then there are the crops that I call kind of the only falls. So these are varieties that were bred by, you know, traditional cultures all over the temperate world to grow in the fall to harvest and store for winter. Like these are the crops that were bred to feed people and keep them nourished, not just calories, but like the vitamins, the minerals they needed in winter to not end up with scurvy and their teeth falling out. And like, you know, the crazy things that can happen if you don't have um, good nutritious food. So a lot of times these are called winter varieties, like the name will have winter in the name or they will have the, um, the term storage in the name. Um, and these are the varieties of the cool season crops that have been bred specifically for that fall and also for storage life. They tend to have thicker skins or they tend to be bigger so that there's less, you know, if you think back to geometry here, they, um, there's more mass on the inside compared to the surface area when it's, when it's bigger. And so there's less area for moisture to be lost. And so they don't dry out, get shriveled up, you know, soft, um, which isn't very appealing. So in beets, there's a variety called Lutz green leaf, um, which produces big um, beets that store pretty well, have a nice thick skin on them. There are winter radishes, they're called, which are these really good radishes. If you like, if you like radishes, they're big. Daikons are a type of winter radish, but there's also um, varieties. Chinese white is probably the one that I've had the most success with, but there's also one called Chinese rose and one called Spanish black. Um, that you plant in like July, August, and then you harvest in the fall and they can store in your fridge for, for months, you know, unlike the little like salad radishes that go bad pretty quickly. There's also what are called winter cabbages. Um, so there's several varieties, as you can see here, that you plant in the fall and they're very cold tolerant. And so usually they will just kind of more sit in the garden and you can harvest them into very late winter. And then there is winter kohlrabi where uh, you can harvest them, they get really big. Um, Gigant winter and super schmelz um, are, and Cossack actually are all German varieties um, that uh, get like the size of a softball, but are not woody. So usually if you let a kohlrabi get real big, it'll get kind of woody and gross on the inside. These were bred to get really big, but not do that. And so they're still nice and tender and crunchy. Um, and will also store pretty well for you in a basement or root cellar or the fridge in the crisper drawer. Um, we have a quick question real quick about seedlings, just the best place to get them, um, mm. which you might have more to say about that, but I would make just a quick little plug. We have our fall plant sale coming up. Um, it's Saturday, August 12th from 9 a.m. to noon at our carriage house on Bell Avenue here in St. Louis. I don't know where everybody's from, but that's where we are. Um, and you will see like some of these varieties, these types of seedlings like at our, at our sale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would also say the the trick mm -hmm. with it's, it's hard to give a recommendation for fall seedlings because it's not generally a very, it's the forgotten season. Um, it's not a very um, popular time for people to be growing plants. So a lot of nurseries don't carry seedlings in the fall for vegetables. So what I would say is call your local um um, like nursery, wherever you would get seedlings in the spring 
and basically say that you want fall seedlings because if they know that there's a demand there, then they might buy it or they may already carry them. But I would definitely just call and um, or check online, see if they, you know, if they post those things um, to check ahead. Cause yeah, it's not as consistent um, as spring and summer seedlings. So then if you kind of know, you know, what you're going to plant, you know, we know when we're going to plant them. Uh, we're planting them when it's hot. <laughs> you know, beginning of August is really hot. Um, the last week of July, the first week of August are statistically the hottest weeks of the year in St. Louis. And that's when we're planting these crops that don't like the heat. Um, and so getting cool season crops started early enough to get a good harvest can be really hard because they don't like that heat. That's why they don't grow in the heat, generally speaking. So um, it can be really helpful to do things to cool your soil down or to keep your soil cooler that will speed germination and it will speed that early growth, which can really, again, help you get a good harvest. And there's a couple different ways to do that that we're gonna go over. Plenty of water is a big one, um, mulching the soil to keep it cooler and then providing natural or artificial shade. So, so one, um, plenty of water. So keeping your plants well watered helps them deal with heat stress. Um, cool season plants are more stressed by heat than warm season crops are. So making sure that they have all of the water that they need is critical because the evaporation of water from the leaves is one of the mechanisms that plants use to kind of cool their environment around them, just like we use sweating to cool ourselves. Um, and it can also just cool the soil down a little bit. The water coming out of the hose is usually pretty cool because it's cool from the ground, the deep um, ground temperatures that the pipes are buried in. So making sure that they're well watered is important. Don't let your cool season plants wilt and get really dry because um, it's gonna really, really stress them out. And mulch is really critical. I honestly think I have these same mulch slides in every single class I teach at this point um, because it's so useful for so many things and it benefits your plants in two ways. So mulch conserves moisture, which as we just talked about, helps to make sure your plants have what they need and helps them to stay cool. And mulch also helps keep the soil cooler, like temperature wise. Um, there were studies done, I haven't seen any that have been done in vegetable gardens, uh, but there have been uh, soil tests um, that have been done on like larger crop fields and the soil temps in no-till corn and soybean fields, which do not have a thick layer of mulch. It just has like a relatively light layer of mulch was eight to 10 degrees lower than tilled corn and bean fields that have no mulch at all. And eight to 10 degrees is big like on us and in soil, it's huge. Um, soil temperatures do not fluctuate as much as air temperatures. And so eight to 10 degrees is really significant and can really reduce the stress on your, your plants, allowing them to grow better um, in the heat. <clears throat> um, and I also wanna clarify when I say mulch, cause a lot of times think of mulch as like a commercial product you need to go to the store and buy. Mulch is any dead plant material can be used as a mulch. Our favorites are straw, as in the like tan dead wheat stems, straw, not the green hay um, and leaves. So in the fall, if you're like raking up or bagging leaves from your yard, don't give those away for free. It's the most valuable mulch that you can have for your garden, honestly. Um, it's really good. But you can also use most of my mulch in my garden is weeds and grass that I have cut around my garden that you just kind of let it dry, heap it up around the base of your plants. It's a great mulch. And then providing shade. In summer, when the sun is very intense, there is actually more light like per square foot than plants can even use at our latitude. So, um, and this is especially true when extreme temperatures reduce the photosynthesis rate. When temperatures get really high, plants actually drop the amount of photosynthesis that they are doing, which means they need even less light. So providing shade to plants can actually boost growth in these situations. And shade can lower the evaporation and temperatures so that plants photosynthesize for longer periods each day when these when temperatures are really high, like they are looking like they're gonna be for the next um, couple of weeks. 
um, which mean, which again, is going to help that early growth. So if you're talking about like warm season crops, which we're not really talking about today, but like 30% shade is what you would need for warm season crops. For the cool season crops that we're talking about, you can cut out 40 to 60% of the sun without taking away too much light for them. They are still going to be getting enough light at this time of year to be doing full photosynthesis that they are able to do. You can provide shade in a couple different ways. One is row cover, which I wouldn't really recommend, but if that's all you have, um, you can do that, but they do retain heat. So if you're gonna use row cover, you would wanna like suspend it over your plants in some way so that you can still get full airflow underneath it. You can use shade cloth, which is like a netting type material that is made specifically to shade. Um, people have reported temperature drops as high as 30 degrees. Um, underneath there, that's pretty extreme. Um, kind of the average is a 10 to 15 degree temperature reduction. Um, and they have actually found that light colors of like the, the shade cloth itself actually allows more light through while reducing temperature the same amount. So black shade cloth, which is the most common color for shade cloth, reduces PAR, which is a measure of the amount of light like the, the wavelengths of light that plants can actually use for photosynthesis. Um, black shade cloth reduced that light by about 50%, while white, red, and gray shade cloth only reduced it by about 30 to 40%, and they had the same temperature reduction. So that's so if you can get a lighter color one, that's preferable. Uh, you can also use, and we sell this, uh, erosion control mats. So this is a non-plastic option that's made out of ute, which is a, like the same um, natural fiber that burlap is made out of. You can also plant your fall crops in the shade of your already growing summer crops. And this can be a great way to utilize your space and get your cool season crops growing faster. So this is kind of an extreme example, but we used to have this type of trellis where we would grow our squash up and then we would plant our fall stuff here. So they would be nice and shaded. And then by the time that this came down, they would have full sun. But you can also just, you know, if you've got tall tomato plants, plant your lettuce kind of around the base where they're going to be shaded a little bit. And that can um, provide that cooling ability of shade for you. And then on the other end of the season, you might need to want, you might need or want to protect your plants from frost, particularly if you're in a situation where you have something that can only handle a light freeze, but you uh, are going to have a hard freeze that you might want to protect them from that because maybe, you know, it's just going to be one night of a hard freeze and then it's going to be relatively mild again. So the best ways to do this when you're just talking about, you know, a couple light freezes is fabric, uh, low tunnels, or cold frames. So for fabric, this is where I'm talking about, you can just drape old sheets, blankets, or towels over plants, just put them on top. Um, and those type of um, kind of natural fiber materials have insulation. Putting like sheet plastic over your plants does virtually nothing because plastic is not really an insulator. Um, if it's if, when it, if it's touching the plant like that, um, it can still freeze where that plastic is touching it. Low tunnels is where you're going to make a hoop. This is a pretty tall one, or you can make a little short one with wire or PVC pipes or something like that. And then you'd put, you know, row cover or plastic over top. And we'll talk about these in more detail in our winter gardening class. You can also do cold frames, which are also sometimes called mini greenhouses, um, which is where you have kind of like a box with a window, with plastic or glass um, on top. The most important thing to know about these, though, is when we're talking about fall, uh, you know, we're usually in situations where it can get pretty cold at night, but then it's usually still relatively mild during the day. And if it's somewhat comfortable during the day, it's going to be real hot in here and probably actually too hot for your summer or for your, your fall crops. And so they're going to need to be vented. So you would, so you'll need to like open them up in the morning and then close them at night, which can be kind of annoying, but, um, but that is what you need to do, especially for, for fall. Okay, so um, we're nearing the end here and then we'll take a few questions. I just wanted to end on a couple words about um, the outdoor classroom in fall. So during this season, you know, the end of August through November, I guess, um, 
how you can use your garden space at your school or youth garden um, for learning. <clears throat> so just like thematically, some of the things that are happening, um, the study of seasons, right? Climate, kind of like how I said before, um, this how fall is such a good opportunity as the sunlight changes to sort of track growth and do those sorts of um, experiments and data collection and things like that. Also a great time to learn about life cycles because your summer crops are producing their seeds, right? And new seeds are maybe going in in the fall. So it's a great time to um, talk about how everything works and changes throughout the year. Um, towards the end of fall, right, we have a lot of decomposition and nutrient replenishment happening in the garden. I would say a lot of these themes apply to garden-based learning in the winter as well. Plenty of cultural connections and celebrations. Um, again, not just Thanksgiving, but like other harvest holidays from various traditions, um, using the foods that grow locally to involve your community and celebrate celebrate with them. Um, and of course, like nutrition, you can always study nutrition in a garden. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting to study how we can continue to nourish ourselves in all seasons rather than just summertime. Um, and then I also wanted to highlight, we have seed to stem lessons um, that Seed St. Louis has created. Um, they're based on next generation science standards. So they're all science-based. I think you can do, if you're not teaching science, you can do a lot in the school garden beyond that realm for sure. Um, and you can always reach out to us about that. Um, our curriculum is for K through five and it's um, a STEM curriculum. We have five units, so adaptations, ecosystems, soil and compost, plant parts and care, and garden animals. Um, many of the lessons in all of these units, you can really adapt to almost any season. Only a few are like very season specific. So here I've just, you can find them all online um, on our website. Here I've just highlighted a few that are great for this time of year. So if you're letting your summer garden grow, um, or if you're using seeds to plant in the fall, um, seed exploration is one of our lessons that would be really great for this time of year. So this is part of adaptations, right? Learning how things um, survive and grow in various environments, what characteristics enable them to do that. Um, studying ecosystems and ecosystem interactions and observing like different spots around school where um, where you're seeing different types of mini ecosystems. And I think if you are practicing like that, the overlapping gardening season where like Dean was talking about where you have like some kind of vining plant shading your newer like fall plants underneath, um, it's just a really great opportunity to kind of See how things interact and grow and when things kind of fade and, and how they how they help each other if you're doing that kind of seasonal planting system that really works together. Um, it's fun to talk about ecosystems at that time. Again, decomposition. So doing experiments with decomposing leaves, like what happens to a leaf when it falls off of a plant. Roots and shoots, like I mentioned before, you're growing a lot of roots and leaves um, in fall crops, so you can study those things. And in terms of garden animals, FBI, in our case, refers to fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates. So a lot of soil science and soil study and study of decomposition, um, lots of digging uh, at this time of year. So here in these pictures, you can see some, some seed saving with beans and lettuce seeds. And then also one really fun thing to do in the fall with students is, our, is the pumpkin graveyard. <laughs> which is a good way to kind of get rid of your pumpkins and also learn about decomposition. <clears throat> okay, so that that's everything. We will answer a couple of questions. Um, but yeah, also just wanted to throw out there some of our upcoming events kind of related to this, our fall plant sale that I mentioned. Dean's gonna do a winter gardening um, and overwintering 
craps class that'll be similar, but also um, cover some different things. And then coming up in August as well, we have a tasting the rainbow class, which I will be doing um, all about involving children in growing, harvesting, and cooking food. How best to do that with kids, um, followed up by like a community potluck in um, Bell Community Garden. So that's what we've got coming up if you're interested in checking out more. Yeah. And thank you, everybody. Thanks.